flies. All right, grab a Bible. Grab a Bible. Yeah, not a phone Bible. Look at that whole stack up there. We got some more. So, you know, use it. All right, so first things first, shout out to Caitlin for, for uh, teaching y'all last week. I don't, know, I don't know if y'all thought so, but I thought she did great. So everybody, let's give her a round of applause. Round of applause for Caitlin. Let's go. Rock and roll. All right. Now, let's get down to business, okay? So, um, last week, she talked through verses 11 through 13 of 2 Timothy, which say this. It says, This statement is trustworthy, for if we died with him, we will also live with him. Um, if we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. So what you see in this section is four different actions that we could, we could do, we could make, and then five promises that point to the faithfulness of Christ Jesus. All right, And that's what Caitlin talked about last week. And I want to mention these. I'm not going to like redo what she did because that's lame. Okay, it's not what I'm here to do. But what I want to say about this is, this, the way that this, the way that this is, this works is Paul says. Remember, this is a trustworthy statement. First things first, in verse 11, there, uh, the statement is trustworthy. That's used only in the pastoral epistles. Did y'all talk about this last week? Did y'all mention this? You did. In small groups. Okay, yeah. So this is only used in the letters to Timothy and Titus, okay? It's the only place in the Bible that this phrase is used. And um, in 1 Timothy 1, 15, 3, 1, and 4, 8 through 9, 2 Timothy 2, 2, 11, obviously, and then in Titus 3, 3 through 8. So what Paul does when he says this is he says, hey, look, this is a trustworthy, this is a statement that you can live by. This has a, a lot of truth value. This has stuff that you can, like, live according to, okay? So, like, listen to what I'm either about to say or what I just said, all right? So, um, what he, when he says that in 1 Timothy 1.15, he uses it to then talk. He says, this is trustworthy. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, of which I'm the foremost. So, he uses it to talk about the grace of Jesus and the mission of Jesus to come and save sinners, right? Which is what he then says, if, I'm, if I was saved, then God saved me as an example. Okay, that was 1 Timothy 1.15. Um, in 1 Timothy 3.1, he says, this statement is trustworthy. If anyone desires to be an overseer, he, desi he desires a noble work. Okay, so he's, he says, this is trustworthy. You know, wanting to be a, a pastor, a lead pastor, that's an important aspect of being a pastor, okay? Like, this is something you can trust, you can live by, okay? Um, in 4, 8, and 9, he talks about the difference between physical in conditioning and training ourselves for godliness. Remember, he says, Physical condition is good. Training physically your body, that's a good thing. But it only has so much, you know, power to it. Uh, it only lasts for so long because eventually we lose these physical bodies. And then he says uh, training for godliness is better because it has impact now on earth and then then later in the future when we're with God in heaven. All right? And then this one here in 2 Timothy 11, uh, 2, 11. And then in, in Titus 3, he talks about just the grace of Jesus. Okay, so you can read... Titus 3, 3 through 8, um, really beautiful explanation of us also previously being sinful, God showing us mercy, and the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. Okay, it's really, really powerful. And he says that this is a trustworthy, a trustworthy statement, something that you can live by. And I, I want to emphasize this, he brings this up as a trustworthy statement, because what's trustworthy about verses 11 through 13 is essentially what it boils down to, if this is my estimation. It boils down to the faithfulness of God. This is why Caitlin said, uh, I think last week her title was The Faithful God. Um, because what this boils down to is God is faithful. If we endure, if we died with him, we'll live with him, right? If we die with him, then he is faithful to make us live with him, all right? It's Romans 6, 1 through 8, basically in, in a shortened version. If we endure, we will also reign 
with him. So if we're faithful through the very, to the very end, then we know there's this promise of reigning with Christ. Okay, Revelation 20 talks about this aspect of, of literally reigning with Christ, being co-heirs. Um, Romans 8 says that we were adopted, and if we're sons and daughters, then we're also heirs. So we're going to be fully there, fully sharing in the ruling, uh, in some aspect of ruling with Christ. Okay, so that's pretty cool. Um, if, but then, oh, then on the contrasting people who endure is people who deny him. So if we deny him, he will deny us, right? This is if you don't put faith in Christ, if you don't accept him, if you don't receive the truth, then you aren't saved, right? And eternity uh, reigning with him is not yours. It's not yours. And then he finishes up with this one. If we're faithless, which is in- in- interesting because, like, if we do something bad, if we don't have enough faith, well, he's faithful, so that's one promise. And then the second promise is he can't deny himself. It would go against his very nature to give us up simply because of our lack of faith. And I think that's a powerful reminder. So his faithfulness, his ability to keep his word, his ability to keep his promises is what Paul's building on. And that's really important for these next set of verses. And I just want to talk through verses 14 through 19 real quick. And I'm going to have some small group time, okay? So look at verse 14, okay? It says, Remind them of these things and solemnly exhort them in the presence of God not to dispute about words, which is useless and leads to the ruin of the listeners. So, remind them of these things. Who is them? Who's, first off, who's Paul writing this letter to? Okay, cool. I got nervous for a second. Uh, yeah, it's Timothy. Okay. Um, so who is Timothy pastoring? Who said it? Ephesus. Yeah, he's in Ephesus, right? The church at Ephesus. So who does Timothy need to remind of the faithful statement from earlier that he just said, the trustworthy statement that he just wrote? Who does he need to remind them of? The, he needs to remind the Ephesian church, right? His job as the pastor is to remind them of what the truth of Scripture is, what the truth of the gospel is. And then here's the thing. Because of God's faithfulness, because of the work of Christ in the gospel, okay, that's essentially 11 through 13 is like this is the gospel. This is our hope, right? Because of that, it doesn't just have impact in the future where we'll reign with him, but it also has impact in the here and now. Okay, so this is kind of a bridge here. Remind them of the faithfulness of God, that he's faithful to his promises, and trust in that, in him, and then from that, live for him. And here's some practical ways to do that, okay? So, remind them, and then solemnly exhort. I think that that is, this is the NASB, it's not ESV. What does the ESV say? Charge them, yeah. Okay, solemnly exhort. When was the last time you used the word solemnly in a sentence? Never. Huh? Huh? Talking about a funeral, describing, yeah, describing a funeral. I would probably even use the word somber usually in place of solemn. But, uh, yeah, it's, so it's interesting. But the, the, I actually kind of like the, that they say it this way because it's interesting. This idea of solemnly exhort is the, the idea of being really, really serious about, about pointing them in a certain direction. Solemnly exhort them, so like very seriously charge them. Call them to a faithful response, okay? Call them to action. Call them to do something. In the presence of God, okay? I'm going to go like, like phrase by phrase tonight. Um, in the presence of God, so does that mean that God is going to be there like in a courtroom and say, place your right hand here um, on my word and then repeat after me? Everything that I say is the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help me God. Right? No, that's not what, that's not what he's saying. In the presence of God, meaning God is omnipotent, God sees all, and this exhortation, this warning, this charge, this command that Timothy's supposed to give the church, right? He's supposed to like use his pastoral authority to hear in the church, and he's supposed to tell them this in the presence of God, meaning this is a really serious thing that they need to focus on, okay? This is a really serious thing that they need to like make sure that they that they check off, that they do right, okay? In the presence of God, meaning God knows whether or not they do it. Okay? It's important. Not to dispute about words, which is useless and leads to the ruin of the listeners. I think this is a really, really powerful transition here from this is the faithfulness of God 
And now, here's some practical living. Don't argue about words. What does it mean not to dispute about words? Do you have any, any ideas of what that might mean? Yeah, I think that you'd be onto something here. I think that's probably what he's getting at. Did y'all hear what Judah said? Okay. Like, you didn't. Um, so basically, what, what Judah's saying, and I think he's right, that in this case, what, what Paul's saying is, don't argue about, like, theological terms, all right? If people believe that Jesus is God's son, he died on the cross, rose again, uh, and that he's the only way to salvation, then sometimes we have to be willing to take a step back and, you know, lose the argument, so to speak, and move on, right? We don't need to just argue and hound on things and and get worked up. And, and honestly, this is a hard thing for me to apply because I really like to debate. And not everybody likes to debate. Did you know that? Some of y'all don't like to debate. See, I love it. I love it. That's how I learn. Talking through things, it helps me like process. It helps me like remember all of those things. Helps me form logical arguments. So I love it. But other people don't love it so much. And so when I think I'm having a friendly debate, other people sometimes think that I'm coming off as a jerk and being really rude and aren't trying to argue and trying to cause arguments. And that's not what I'm trying to do, but it's what ends up happening. You know what I'm saying? So it's something I have to think about too. So this is, this is a challenge. Don't argue about words. Don't waste your time with that because it's useless, first of all. It's a waste of time because, because one, it, it's not, like we're not going to solve the hardest questions to answer in the Bible um, in a 20-minute Wednesday night youth lesson. You know, like, I wish I was that good. I wish I was that cool. Like, I wish I could come up here and be like, by the way, Calvinism versus Arminianism, guess what? You know what I mean? But I can't. That's not me. Um, I'm just not that smart. No one is. We're, it's useless, okay? And here's the thing. It leads to the ruin of the listeners. So this is something that's really important to think about. It leads to the ruin of the listeners. That word, ruin, um, the word that he used there is where we get our English word, catastrophe. In fact, it sounds almost the exact same in Greek. But so literally it leads to like destruction. It leads to catastrophe. It leads to this massive system failure for those who are listening to this debate. It's not healthy. It's not helpful. Not only is it useless, but it also tears people down when we sit and argue over certain things that we have no business arguing over. Okay, it tears people down. It leads to the ruin of the listeners. Um, and so I kind of put together a little list, and you can write this down if you want. Because here's the thing. There's a few questions you have to ask. Number one, um, is there, are there things that we should argue over? Like, are there things that we should stand firm on? I think there are, right? If somebody comes out, you know, teaching false doctrine, we have to be willing to stand up and say, no, that's incorrect. Um, for, and not for... Not because we want to cause people to stumble, but we actually want to protect the people who heard the message, right? We want to help them understand the truth. Um, so there are certain times where we, have to, we do have to argue about things, right? Like that's, we have to debate things. We have to come to a conclusion, all right? Um, but what kinds of arguments over words are appropriate and in what context? That's the question. When is it appropriate to argue over words and, and what's the context where it's appropriate, okay? So let me go through this. Um, there are times when debating about words is edifying. It's building up. It is actually useful for both people involved or all parties involved. Okay? Not destructive. So here are some rules that I made up. So there, this is not from the Bible. This is from Joseph. So if it's wrong, you know, blame Joseph, not the Bible. Okay? I'm just letting you know it's me. Okay. So number one, if you don't know if everyone is at a similar place in their walk with Christ, then don't debate. Okay, if you might be, you might be further along in your walk with Christ than somebody else, and so if you start having a debate with with another person around them, they might come away from that conclusion. This third person might come away from the con from the conversation and say, "Well, I'll never know enough. Well, this is too much for me," and be discouraged, uh, and it might destroy their faith even. Right? Okay, so be careful with that. Number two, if you know that there are people in who want to debate who are um, particularly bothered by the topic, or, get this, particularly excited about the topic, um, don't debate, <laughs> okay? Don't debate, yeah. Th that's, that's a separate issue, yeah. 
that's a separate issue. If you have to stand up for truth, stand up for truth. But if it's an argument within the, within the realm of orthodoxy, kind of follow this checklist. Does that make sense? You, so, would you agree? Yes. Yeah. Christians talking to Christians about issues that are, we'll call them like third level issues, right? Some people love to get worked up about third level issues. It's like this has nothing to do with salvation. Right. Yeah. The, like the, how many angels exist, like even things like that. People get all worked up about these things. And it's like this is a waste of time. You're, you're tearing people down, you know. So anyways, so, um, so if, it, if it's really exciting or really bothersome, don't debate, okay? Um, if you know, without a doubt, that the debate that you're about to have is going to cause further disunity or further arguments, don't debate, okay? Don't debate. Leave it, leave it be, all right? And then the last thing is, this is kind of where it's safe, all right? If you know that it's safe to debate what you want to debate, all parties involved with the conversation agree and want to discuss it, and everyone knows how to remain level-headed, Go ahead, all right? Have a conversation. Work things out. Learn. Grow. Sometimes you have to have conversations and be like, hey, what does this mean? And, like, that's a totally safe thing to do. I'm not, I'm not telling you not to ask questions. What I'm telling you is don't be a theological bully, okay? At my, my sister's funeral, when, uh, <laughs> that's sad. Uh, but at my sister's funeral earlier this year, I wrote something to, to say. And one of the things that, so my sister Kaylee, you got to understand, like, I love her to death, um, that sounds bad, too. But uh, I love her. And uh, anyways, she, she was really, like, she, she's, like, really strongly, like, um, this term may not make much sense to you, and, and you can forget about it. If it doesn't, it's fine. She's like, Calvinists are just bullies. They're, uh, they're so, you know, they're so mean. They think they know everything. And uh, she had some rough experiences with people who believe Calvinism. And I don't want to get into that right now. But let me just say. At her funeral, I decided there were people there who I knew we grew up with who were Calvinists. And so I was going to say, don't be a Calvinist as a joke. Because it's like 10 things from learning that I've learned from Kaylee. And one of the things was going to be, don't be a Calvinist. But I changed it to, don't be a Calvinist. And I marked it out and I said, don't be a theological bully. <laughs> so that's what I did. I thought that was funny. So, but this is, this is what 2 Timothy 2.14 is getting at. Don't be somebody who just you know, pounds people with this doctrine that doesn't matter. And what it does is it tears people down as they listen to it. It's like, wow, how divisive can Christians be? How mean-spirited to each other can Christians be? It's not helpful, okay? So that's, that's verse 14. I just want to kind of work through that. Um, leads to the ruin of the listeners, okay? It's a dangerous thing. Um, my computer locked, so give me one second. Okay, here we go. All right, 15. So, um, this verse is really cool, and it's kind of randomly placed here, I think. It's, it's intentional, but it seems kind of random. Be diligent to present yourself a worker approved to God as a worker who does not need anything or does not need to be ashamed um, accurately handling the word of truth. Remember who Paul's writing to is Timothy. Okay, what's Timothy's profession? What does he do? What's his job? Pastor, yeah, he's an evangelist, he's a pastor, okay, he's there to train up other pastors in Ephesus, okay, so this seems like something that's only important to pastors, but I have some things that I think can be encouraging to everybody here from this. Number one, if you ever, raise your hand if you've ever explained something in the Bible to another person, you ever explained anything in the Bible to another person, yeah, okay, I think most of us have, perfect, love it, here's the deal. Be diligent in what you study so that whenever you do teach other people, when you explain things to other people, you can do it rightly. You can handle God's word appropriately, and you don't twist it and make it about yourself or about anything else that it's not about. But handle the word well, okay? Um, and if you do that, if you're diligent, if you're hardworking, if you're careful, if you're intentional, then you have no need to be ashamed. You can confidently speak about the truth in Scripture and say, this is what God's Word says. I've been very careful. I've been very, very diligent. I know that what I'm saying is from God's, God's Word. So you can, you can rest in that. You have nothing to hide from, okay? In fact, you have a shield in front of you to hide behind, which is, I'm not saying my thoughts. I'm saying the Bible's thoughts, okay? Like just a minute ago, I gave you my thoughts, all right, now what I'm telling you is the Bible's thoughts. So if you're mad at me for this, like, yeah, that's not on me. You know what I'm saying? So 
uh, and accurately handling the word of truth. Um, so shame comes for the teacher of the Bible. And, and when I say teacher, I don't just mean people who do that vocationally. Like my job is, is uh, I'm, I would be a Bible teacher, right? But Caleb teaches the Bible. Brian teaches the Bible. But he also works at Poly America, and he also works at an architecture firm. Like I'm just saying, their jobs aren't in the church, but they teach the Bible. You guys have friends who you explain things through. Your job may not be to teach the Bible, but you do help people understand the Bible. So shame comes when we mishandle God's word, when we misrepresent the truth of God's word. So we have to be really careful about that. We have to be really careful. In the book of James, it says that not many people should become teachers because they're judged with a harsher, uh, a stricter judgment. Um, these are just things to, to think about. Um, but thankfully, uh, you know, this was written like 2,000 years ago. So in the past 2,000 years, we've had some great theological minds who put together a lot of great stuff. And you have access to pretty much everything you need online for free, or you could buy resources. So thankfully now we don't have anybody who mishandles God's word, right? That never happens anymore. No, it does, actually. It's very, very common. In fact, there's a pastor this week who's made a lot of, a lot of headlines because for a long time he's, he has a very, uh, a very faithful pastor. And uh, in recent years, uh, maybe the past 15 or so years, he's kind of slowly dipped into um, teaching some things that aren't historically orthodox, biblical, true. Um, and in doing so, he's caused some disruption. It's happened like this week. He started, he, he taught about, um, about sexuality and talked about how, uh, you know, like God's word on sexuality isn't necessarily the right, we haven't been reading it the right way and we need to handle things. You know, it's like, it's just like you know, twisting scripture to, uh, to teach his own message, right, of, of whatever acceptance is in his mind. It's a dangerous thing. And, and it's, it's inaccurately handling the word of truth. So it's just a reminder that people are out there mishandling God's word. That happens a lot. A lot of them are really good at the internet. Like, I'm not good at the internet. If y'all saw that video that I put on social media tonight, that was, about the, that was about the height of my editing skills right there. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm not good at the internet. Some of these, some of these teachers who mishandle the word of truth uh, are very good at the internet, and they're very good at TikTok, and, and, and they're very good at um, finding ways to get their false message out, okay? So you have to be careful. You have to be careful. And this is what he actually goes into next. And remember, this is all part of, of living in God's faithfulness. Be diligent. Because of God's faithfulness, be diligent, all right? Um, avoid empty speech. Because of God's faithfulness, because of his promises, avoid uh, avoid those things, all right? And then verses 16 through 18, I'm put together here. Avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead to further ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. I'm going to stop right there, because look, there's two categories here. In the ESV, I do not like this. They, they only say, like, avoid irreverent speech, right? What, is that what it says? Irreverent babble. I hate that. Uh, no offense to the ESV. I think they did a good job most of the time. I hate that. There's just two words in the Greek. Avoid worldly and empty chatter. Okay? You could summarize it to be irreverent babble uh, if you want, but I don't, think it, that, I don't think that helps. I don't think that's helpful. Okay? Because there's a particular reminder here, and it, it's really helpful when you see it written like this. All right? So avoid worldly and empty chatter. Worldly chatter. What in the world is that? Any guesses? Any thoughts? Thank you for going that direction. Yeah, sports talk shows. That's a great... What? Game shows. Yeah, what else? Because I love that you did that because... Yeah, what's up? Yeah, anything not like, you know, the not, not um, scriptural, not... not uh, regarding the truths of God, yeah. But I love that Caleb went the direction of sports shows because I think sometimes we'll read this. We'll say, okay, avoid worldly speech, avoid worldly chatter, whatever. Um, and we'll go, okay, um, so I'm going to avoid people that talk about uh, sex before marriage and drugs, and I'm going to avoid people that talk about killing people, and I'm going to avoid people that, like, I'm going to avoid those conversations, 
right? And we like to, like, put the categories of what is, like, worldly, and the worldly stuff is the stuff that's, like, really bad to us, right? But I'm going to suggest to you that it's not just those things, all right? I think that there's a really strong temptation, especially in the social media age, to focus all of our time and energy on worldly chatter, okay? So when we do that, when we focus all of our time and energy on worldly chatter, what we do is we, we, we start to, to sound like it. We start to think like it. We start to look like it, okay? So it's not just things like live a sexually immoral life, and kill and do, steal whatever you want, like you know, looting stores is fine. Like that's not it's not just those things, okay? It do what? Yeah, or or telling dirty. It's not just as simple as telling dirty jokes either. It's it's more than that too, right? It's okay. I, I wrote up some 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 situations that I think might apply to some of y'all in your different areas of life, okay? Uh, so so think about the person, and, and like maybe you know somebody that comes to mind. Don't say that person out loud. Um, but think about the girl, maybe, who focuses all of her attention on the worldly definition of beauty, okay? And so she finds herself prideful, con- condescending, and hateful toward other girls who don't fall into the world's view of beauty. So you know what I'm talking about? Like the girl that, like, she watches all the makeup shows. She's, like, she takes all the time to do whatever. Like, everything is about making herself look as Whatever is beautiful in the world's eyes, right? Have you, have you ever met somebody like this? I would suggest that maybe she's paying attention to worldly chatter. And that that is what then she lives like. What about the guy who plays video games? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Okay. Guy who plays video games and spends all his time watching video game players on YouTube. Hang on. Eventually, eventually, look, if this is you, that's cool. But, like, shh, shh, shh. eventually... Every conversation is devoid of meaning because it's a constant barrage of video game jokes, bad language, quick burns, and laziness. I'm just saying, there's, look, you inundate yourself with a certain culture, a worldly talk, a worldly chatter, and eventually this is what your life starts to look like. All right? What about the person who is so inundated in sports, like Caleb said, this is one I have to watch myself on, okay? That, um, that, that their attitude towards people who don't meet their expectations, like the players they're a fan of, and then maybe how this transfers over in other walks of life. Whenever people don't meet their expectations, they become hateful, mean-spirited, and intentionally malicious. If you guys go look at a sports team's social media post and read the comments, I'm just saying, people say absolutely horrible things about athletes because... They feel like they can, right? They feel like they can say whatever they want. It's horrible. But if that's all you read and that's all you take in, pretty soon your language starts to look the same. Can I, can it wait? You good? You want to ask me after? Okay, go ahead. So I'm not so much talking about the games. What I, that's a good question, because I'm not saying, like, playing video games is bad. I play video games, too, all the time. Can't you, like, I just, yeah, I'm so good at them. So, no, um, anyways, no, I, I'm not saying that playing video games is bad. What I'm saying is if, if the things you talk about, like, and focus all your attention on, and love above everything else is video games and your favorite YouTube streamer, and and then your life begins to look and your words that you say begin to sound like what you watch and what you listen to and who you uh, love more than other things, then I would suggest that that's um, letting yourself fall into this idea of living in worldly chatter. Does that make sense? You see the, the distinction? I think that what we have to guard ourselves against isn't playing games or watching sports or caring about makeup. I think what we have to watch ourselves on is that those things don't become our top priority. That they don't consume us. Yeah, because when they do, then it shows in the way that we talk. Um, I have a couple other things, but um, 
Yeah. There's just Look, I just want you to guard yourselves. I just want you to guard yourselves. Don't focus on, on worldly chatter. Um, yeah. Empty chatter, so worldly and empty. I think the point was kind of made clear there, but empty stuff would be don't, val- don't overvalue what's useless. These things on earth are temporary, okay? Whatever you're obsessed with now is not going to be there for eternity unless your obsession is, is God himself, okay? So I just want to make that point clear. Um, but here's the thing. It's, it's, this is important because it will lead to further ungodliness because it changes the way that we live. It, it, instead of pursuing godliness and of putting that above everything else, and we put worldly things and useless things above, above godliness— then that's what we look like. But if we put godliness above these worldly things, then it produces more godliness. Remember in 1 Timothy, train yourself in godliness. And it spreads. That's the issue, is that this spreads. It doesn't just stop. It doesn't just stop with you. It spreads to those around you. It spreads to those who you influence. He talks about these two guys, Hermanius and Philetus. These fellows, evidently, Paul used to think were like legit, and they were like sincere, and then they got caught up in some worldly, empty philosophy regarding the resurrection from the dead, so the, uh, the second coming of Jesus, and they changed their whole theological outlook. Evidently, they departed from faithful doctrine, and then, here's the thing, this is what he said, it spreads like gangrene, which is an infection, and so it spreads like that, and here's the thing, these guys took their misunderstanding that they had come to, to realize, and they went out and tried to lead other people astray. It jeopardized the faith of people, that they would go out and try to lead other people astray. So um, the way that I like to think about this verse, or this, this idea of it spreading, um, ha- raise your hand if you've heard of deconstructing your faith. You ever heard of this? Deconstruction? Deconstructing your faith? Okay, less than I thought. Okay, so deconstruction. Here's the thing about deconstruction. Everyone who deconstructs their faith wants to tell other people that they should de- deconstruct their faith and how to deconstruct their faith. There's one guy who was a pastor for a long time. His name's Joshua Harris. I don't mind saying his name because I think this dude's a phony. Um, it's on YouTube. I don't care. He's a phony. Anyways, uh, so Joshua Harris. Okay, he was a pastor for a long time. He left his wife, divorced. Okay, first off, I will say this, one thing respectable. He stepped down from his pastoral position. And then he left his wife. He said that he was no longer a Christian. He, you know, completely departed from the faith. He fully embraced uh, every sinful, you know, worldly philosophy that you can think of. Um, and, and then, here's what he did. This is what really drives me up the wall. He, he went out and he released this program, How to Deconstruct Your Faith Like Me. What a scam, bro. Like, are you kidding me? But this is what happens. He's like Hymenaeus and Philetus. He's like, the, he's like these guys. It spreads. So here's what you have to do. You have to be watchful. You have to be careful, and you have to guard yourself so that you, uh, your faith isn't in jeopardy, okay? And then verse 19, here's the bookend to this whole section, and I love it. Because Paul says, nevertheless, or I don't know, what does ESV say there at the beginning of verse 19? Do what? Yeah, just but God's from I love it. No matter what, no matter people who might try to like lead you astray no matter the temptation to be faithless no matter the temptation to argue over words and and hurt people's faith no matter all of those things god's firm foundation is still present it still stands all right god's firm foundation is christ right and it has this seal the lord knows who are his we have this confidence that god knows who are his god knows you god knows you if you gave your life to christ if you've, if you've given your life to Christ, God knows you personally. He knows you intimately. He loves you. He saved you by the blood of his son. And if you haven't given your life to Christ, that opportunity is very, very real, very, very present for you. This is everyone who names the name of the Lord is to keep away from wickedness. So God is faithful. Remember that? Just like in the verse 11 through 13, God's faithful. He knows who is his. He knows those who are his. And, and then this next part, which is this, the verses that we just studied, avoid wickedness. If you follow Christ, the call is a life to godly living, okay? It's to avoid the things we just talked about. Like, this is why I love this. He, like, sandwiches this in here perfectly. So it seems like that verse 15 where it talks about being diligent and all that's kind of random, but it's not because being diligent to be an approved worker is a strong way to keep away from evil, from wickedness, all right? So that's why I love this. It's just really, really, it's, it's, it's practical, 
okay? Avoid worldly talk, um, all those things. And it's just, it's, it's lovely. I mean, God is faithful, and because he's faithful, we get to live out the truth of his word. Right, that's powerful, man. That's, that is good stuff. So um, that's what I want to encourage you guys with tonight. We do have a little bit of time for small groups. Um, and um, you want to do youth led again? Like youth led?